I realize that I'm very anguished about society, and I never, I'm never pleased by anything. I'm starting to realize that if I were listening, I'd actually like the show more because of it. Because you, you got to think about the dynamics of it. I take a risk by sharing with you my displeasures, right? On the other hand, you say, well, why would anyone listen to that? The answer is because they're filled with such displeasure in their daily life that they like to hear that I also experience it, even though I shouldn't. <laughs> the point is that I shouldn't. I do have everything. You know, I, I drive around in my car and I see various um, bumper stickers. Some of them are like these health help, self-help bumper stickers. I almost did a dyslectic thing, a, a health self thing, a help self thing, a self-help thing which say, um, what are you grateful for? And it stops you in your tracks. So sometimes when I'm lying in bed, grousing about how miserable my life is, I say to myself, what am I grateful for? And I have a big list of what I'm grateful for. And it stops me. It's not bad. Some of this self-help, uh, pseudo-Christian stuff is pretty good. I like it. And it works for me. But it doesn't stop me from complaining. For example, if I go to a restaurant, I move tables several times. Do I do it for effect? No. I do it for reasons that are, make makes sense. I mean, like last night I went to a local restaurant, and it was it was pretty empty. I come in, the table's there. Right away I see two things I don't like, and I ask Mrs. F. as to move with me. She's used to it, of course. Why did I move? Because behind her in the other booth to her head, the back of her head, was an older guy, younger woman, lovey-dovey, showing it couple. I didn't want to listen to them. I saw the bottle of wine. I saw the swirling of the glass from the trailer park trash that he picked up somewhere and he already turned into the, the second missus. I didn't want to watch it. To my left was a loud uh, uh, older couple that I knew were just getting dessert and they were gassed up on the wine. I knew with two glasses of cheap wine and the sugar, I didn't stand a chance to digest so much as a pinto bean. I moved. Am I wrong for expressing this to you? Am I wrong for moving? The answer is no. I have to move tables in a restaurant to get where I want to sit or I don't, I don't want to go. It's not that I'm doing it to be difficult. Do you do that as well? Does anyone else live this way, or am I the only one on earth who does this in a restaurant? Number two, the children, thank God for them, made it to adulthood. They're adult children. I want to thank God that they did get this far. But they knew by the time they were a certain age, like eight or nine, that when we checked into a hotel on vacation, they knew that whatever room we were given was only the first room. They didn't even unpack their bag after a few years. They would put the bag in the room and say, uh, Dad, we'll be back in a while. Let us know what room you're actually going to be in. Because <laughs> inevitably, <laughs> the first room was no good. It's what hotels do to families. They hate families. There's a secret. They hate families. They hate traditional families. And inevitably, the snotty bell clerk or whoever it was, desk guy, they always gave us a roomie the next to construct. And I would call from thousands of miles away. Is it a quiet room? Yes, sir. Is there any ongoing construction? No, sir. Have you sprayed the room with pesticides, perfume, or any other pungent uh, components before we get there because we all don't want to? No, sir. We, we understand it's a scent-free room. Anything else, sir? Whatever you ask for, they give you the opposite. So I'd get there. Next door would be heavy construction with a pile going in right out the window. The room would have been sprayed by somebody from another country for whom a room must smell like uh, a cat house in Tijuana on a July day. And, of course, uh, and, and then to top it all off, there'd usually be some kind of stain of a bodily fluid underneath the bed cover when you pulled back. The, <laughs> that happened to me, I swear to you. I told you about it. We went to Cancun last winter. End room, good air, everything fine. Bed cover. It looked like the horse's head from the Godfather had been removed prior to my arrival. Is there any wonder I move? Savage. Hi, we are Armstrong and Getty. We're on every weekday morning from 6 to 10. He is a national treasure. He is Dr. Savage on Talk 910 KNEW. Now let's go to the callers. Fort Lauderdale, Michael, welcome to the Savage Nation. Dr. Savage, you're not the only one who lives by that code of complaining. You are like a carbon copy of listening to my dear old dad. And, and it's like <laughs> All right, now, but here, okay, I accept it. I'm an older guy in radio. In fact, I'm probably at this point the, the most senior member of the talk radio clan, even though we all hate each other and are jealous of each other. I am the most senior member. But do you find it bad radio or good radio to listen to my problems? I find it wonderful and captivating because it brings up just so many wonderful memories and, and of my relatives from the Bronx and 
family vacations that turn to misery and lousy <laughs> Oh, it's like, Your family vacations that turn to misery. That is such. Why does that make me happy? What's wrong with me? I don't know, but you know, I've been in many a room. I was Williamsburg, Virginia. We were baited and switched, where we got a bum room next to a railroad track. And my. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll bet when you call in advance, you told them quiet room, and they said yes, sir, right? Oh, absolutely. It was you know, it was the second coming of Valhalla, and and we <laughs> ended up in some po dunk flea bag motel. <laughs> it was... Oh, so in other words, my complaints, although they're kind of tiresome, they're actually real, and they're, 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 you, you like listening to them because they're based on reality. Affectionately, and my family referred to them as my father's observations. They're no longer... So when, when your father took you on vacation, you changed rooms a couple of times each trip? Absolutely. We changed hotels. Oh, well, he was a step ahead of me. Oh, he was... He's... I didn't have the, the gumption to take the kids to another whole building. Oh, Although no. I was close to I was close to it a few times. What was your father like in a restaurant? How many tables a night? I was just going to get to that. How about this? He's the kind of guy that would be barking out rebuttals to these uh, New England ponytail, Oxford shirt wearing liberals. He'd be behind. What, the what do you mean? What do you mean? He would listen to them at other tables? Oh, he would eavesdrop, but then he would chime in something. He was return. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so he would actually take them on uh, at the other table. Okay, here's the priceless story. You'll get a kick out of this. We're in a supermarket parking lot. A kind of a young man's car drives by with that South Beach techno music blaring. Mm. There's the person in the passenger car has long hair. So my father says, hey, lady, you're a little old to be playing that kind of music, <laughs> aren't you? Well, anyway, the car parks and out gets this Fabio-looking man. Oh, a muscular guy with long hair. Here it comes. Yeah. So my, the, the South Boston Irish came out of my father, and uh, it was it was a sight to behold. Well, what, what what happened? Now you got me on the edge of my seat. What happened? They exchanged words, and um, in order to make the peace, my father didn't know really how to do it, so he bought him a flower. He said, because I don't know what to make of you. So he bought him a yeah, flower. Yeah, but the, the guy didn't take a swing at your father. He probably knew the guy. Your father was just a guy with... Strong opinions and guts. My father's a tough South Boston Irish guy. Cop for 25 years, Vietnam veteran. He doesn't take lip service. Yeah, but wait a minute. In his 60s, he could have gotten his, his butt whipped by the young Fabio, right? Oh, absolutely not. My father what do you mean? Your, fa you know, your father could have beaten up the Fabio character? My father scares the death out of me, and I'm a grown man. <laughs> oh, you mean your father's still with us? Yes, my father's. My, I have the pleasure of my company of my father routinely. Thank oh, God. you're a lucky. You're a lucky man. Oh, you're lucky that he's still living. And again, I want to thank you for just you know bringing me down with those memories and and just you know all the guys from New York. Hey, let me ask you, Michael. The weather in Fort Lauderdale has been very rainy in the last few months, right? It's on and off every day. On and off every day, three o'clock, like like clockwork. And my summer baseball program, we're getting rained out. Because I'm, I'm planning on going to Florida soon. I know in the summer. Why? Because the water's 85 degrees. That's why. But the rain is keeping me away. I would love to take you tarpon fishing. Yeah, it'll be a one-way trip. It's a, fi a Sicilian fishing trip, a one-way trip, huh? Absolutely not. I would love to take you into some pristine country and the back country and, and teach you how to fish for tarpon and bonefish and be in places That's where... amazing. So you do you do the real McCoy. What kind of boat do you use? I use a Hughes, a 19-foot flat skiff with a tunnel hull. So I don't... Oh, you're a, you're a real fisherman. Uh, I moved down here from Boston specifically. Yeah, and you thought you were getting away from the liberals, huh? No, I, I moved into Liberal Central. Yes. Thank God I... Fort Lauderdale... The whole area of South Florida is is so communistic, it's frightening. No, except for the Cubans. And by the way, the young Cubans are already twisted in their brains. They have Castroites. Actually, you know what? The Cubans down here, every one of them in their shops has an American flag. Every one of them yes, the same. older Cubans are patriotic, rock rib conservatives. The younger ones have been brainwashed by America. Children I teach, Dr. Savage, they are wonderful, they are patriots, they get it, they listen to their grandmothers and grandfathers about the Russian shoes and the guys being yanked out of their houses for saying the wrong thing and, and a chivato on every corner.
they they get it, and the kids that I teach are wonderful. What do you what what, what do you teach, Michael? I teach mathematics. Oh, God bless you. Yeah, well, they don't make them like your father anymore. And, uh, hey, Michael, did you read that story of the cop from the Bronx, the detective, for 22 years, and what happened to him with that punk, the, the kid who shot someone in the elevator in the face? Yeah, and then, they, and then I want to know how he, the kid got an MP3 player into the interrogation room. All right, now, I talked about this last night at home, and you know what the smartest woman in the world told me? She said someone set that detective up inside the police station. In other words, if they frisked the punk after finding him and it was a slam dunk case, then they send the detective in. What was he, like a Serpico? He was one of these honest cops just doing his job and the other guys in the department were on the take? Because they should have gotten that MP3 player out of his pocket. Absolutely. Mrs. S is very insightful, Dr. Savage. Well, all right. So somebody set that cop up. But I want to say on this show, Michael, if they take the cop down and take away his...